Welcome. This is our last technical session of the day, which uh, we get a really exciting topic, which is failure. Ah. Everybody loves to talk about failure, right? Failure is the most exciting thing we can think of at the end of the day. So we want to talk about automating uptime, which is the inverse of failure. How do you deal with failure? And how do you minimize that in your environment? I'm Chad Harrington. I'm the Vice President of Marketing here at Adaptive. I have a much smarter companion, Tim Shaw, who's here with me uh, to uh, help with so. the demo and explain more of the, the concepts as we talk about them. But this is a pretty exciting topic to me because I think of the work that goes on in HPC, it's really important work. Uh, we're talking about changing the world, we're talking about developing new products, we're talking about curing cancer, we're talking about uh, finding uh, billions of dollars worth of oil. These are important things. And in order to exploit those things, things need to not fail. <laughs> because job failures can cost a lot of money, they can cost a lot of time, and you know it might cause, we were just about to find the cure for cancer, and that node failed. That would be a very bad thing. So we want to avoid that as much as possible. So to do that, we're going to talk about sources of downtime. Where does it come from? How can we minimize that downtime so that its impact is as minimal as possible? How do we respond to failures when they do occur? And then we'll give you a demonstration of, of some techniques that you can use that Tim will show us how you can minimize downtime in your own environment. So first of all, I have a poll. So uh, not including software bugs, we're going to leave those aside. Uh, how many of you, ex or how many failures have you experienced at your site in the last year? So anyone have zero failures last year? Raise your hand. Define a failure. A failure is a, a node went down for some reason other than a software bug. Okay, so we had, we had zero failures, nice. Yeah, right. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody with zero failures? Okay, we didn't get zero. How about one to two? Anybody have one to two failures? All right, I see some heads shaking there. Uh, how about three to five? Anybody? Oh, nice. You're from which uh, establishment? University of Michigan. University of Michigan, the, the greatest quality people here. Sounds great. You got very good hardware over there, so uh, good job. And with five to ten, five to ten failures, okay? Get a couple more. Ten plus. Hopefully that's the rest of us. <laughs> Two hands, hands in the back there. Okay, great. So failure is a reality, right? It, it does happen. It's not a rare occurrence. And one of the things that we learn in life is if something happens, even if it's random, you don't know when it's going to happen, but if it happens regularly enough, we should have a strategy for dealing with it. And that's really what we want to talk about today. It's going to happen. You don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen, so how do you deal with it? All right, next poll. What's your most common source of failure? So there are a bunch of possible ones up here, disks, networking, other hardware, human error, or something else. Uh, we left off software bugs, as I said earlier. So let's get a poll. Your most, think about just for a second, what's your most common source of failure across those 10 plus failures you had last year? How many of you think it's disks? Okay, one, two, all right. Networking. No one, wow, you got rock solid networks, good. Uh, other hardware that isn't disks or networking, okay. Wow, a lot of that, okay. By the way, what, what other kind of hardware fails most? What are you thinking of? Memory. Memory. Memory, okay. Memory. CPU. Memory, CPU, GPU, okay. All those components fail. Human error. Anyone feel like that's their top thing? Okay. A couple honest people here, good. I'm sure it's not your human errors, but someone's human error in the organization. Misconfiguration is a very common cause of downtime and uh, causes a lot of issues. Anyone, something else that wasn't on this list come to mind? Yes, what was your... Power, okay, so power just going up and down, don't have redundant sources probably, and uh, it happens, right? Yep. It certainly happens in my house. Uh, <laughs> that's something that can impact high performance computing, right? Something that we want to deal with. All right, so sources of downtime, we talked about some of these. Disks fail, right? Uh, it was very interesting actually, Google, who owns probably more disks than any organization should be allowed to own, uh, did a study of all their disks because they had tons of, you know, every day they were having like a thousand drives fail. And they came up with something they called the bathtub curve. That they found that disks died very early in their lifetime and then the mortality rate went way down and then it spiked up again late in their lifetime. So disks tended to either have manufacturing issues that were flushed out pretty early or they died, you know, I think the, the time was roughly four or five years, which was kind of their average lifespan of a drive. So 
disks fail, but they're actually somewhat predictable. So, you know, one thing you can do is before you put a node into a critical system, run it for a while and just write a bunch to the disk, read a bunch from the disk and see if the disk is going to fail. Because if it's going to fail, it's very likely it's actually going to fail in the first few hours of usage. So, a little tip from our friends at Google. Uh, file systems fail. So file systems fill up. Network connections to those file systems go down. Uh, it's, it's a real issue that we deal with in, in network systems and in file systems. Networks go down. In, in high performance computing, we often have multiple networks, right? We might have an infinity band network, we might have an Ethernet network, we might have a 10 gig network thrown in there somewhere. And uh, different adapters, you may have access via the infinity band but not the ethernet or vice versa you know they can go up and down at different times and sometimes you can actually exploit that and if you can reach a node via one versus the other you can use that connection to restart something uh, jobs fail for lots of reasons software errors misconfiguration human intervention systems overheat right i think someone maybe mentioned heat as we talked about especially as you start thinking about gpus and just the, the raw compute power in terms of watts that's happening there they can overheat. Uh, and components fail. Uh, several of you mentioned DRAM, right? DRAM is, uh, you know, <laughs> it's interesting that the, the elemental cell of DRAM is one transistor. And they're actually very sensitive to alpha particles, which happen to be flying all around in the world. And they just reset that transistor, and that's all there is. There's not a, a big amount of protection around DRAM, so they get errors. Now, we have ECC, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but ECC can correct. ECC is error coding correction, something like that, error correction coding, I think. Uh, and it can, it can detect and correct single bit errors if you have ECC RAM, but double bit errors, if there were two alpha particles that hit that thing at the same time, can't be corrected, but they can be at least detected. So if you don't have ECC RAM, you've got big problems. If, even if you have ECC RAM, there are certainly cases where you're going to have issues that occur. Uh, and people fail, right? We all know that uh, people submit jobs and make mistakes and set up things they shouldn't and cause other issues, misconfigure networks, all these cause downtime. So we know bad stuff's going to happen, right? We, we've talked about a lot of sources of these different kinds of downtime. So what are you going to do about it? What, what, what can we do? Uh, the answer is policy. And this is where, uh, if you look up in the corner of this slide here, we have this cute graphic. This is actually our attempt at uh, graphically realizing or graphically describing the intelligence engine that is Moab. We think of Moab sort of as a brain, and it doesn't necessarily have arms and legs, those are the resource managers that you connect it to, but it's the brain. And the thing that we believe sets Moab apart from other schedulers and workload managers out there is we have policy-driven workload management. So you can set policies, and as you probably know, if you've looked into the documentation or tried setting various policies. We have a wide array of policies, lots of different kinds of policies that can handle different things. Now the beauty of policy is it automates what happens when something happens. So what we want to talk about and discuss a little bit in detail is when some of these bad things happen, what are you going to do about it? And we'll talk about some of the built-in policies that can help you. And then, <coughs> excuse me, we'll talk about the custom policies or the custom triggers and events and uh, metrics that you can use to manage in a policy-based fashion what happens when there's downtime in your environment. So you want to minimize downtime, right? We don't want to be this guy. Now, first case we want to talk about is just straight up death. The, the, the node died and here we have node 1791. He lived for five years and he dutifully executed all his, all his jobs, but now he's dead. The motherboard fried or something, he's a dead node. This is actually the easiest case that we're going to talk about. If, if a node is not going to come back, if it's really dead, what do you do? So this is where the node alloc res failure policy comes in very handy. And if you search our documentation for that phrase, <coughs> then you'll find, uh, you'll find this page as well as some other information. And actually, there's some really good, if you search in the docs for this phrase, and then look at the other links at the bottom. Uh, there's a lot of background information that we don't have time to go into in this short session, but it gives you a lot of ideas about how Moab thinks about these different types of failures and what to do about them. So with that, this is kind of your new best friend in terms of dealing with death. Really what this policy describes is what should happen if a node is down and dead and uh, not coming back. So first of all, you can cancel the job. That's a very simple policy. Uh, you can hold, which means 
requeue the job, but don't start it. Leave it on hold. You can ignore. If it's, if it's uh, in your environment, if failures are common and nodes are fluctuating, maybe you just want to ignore it. Uh, if you're using a virtualization type environment, you can migrate things away. Uh, and notify, you can notify the administrator but not take any other action. The one that we kind of suggest in this case is requeue. That, okay, that node went down, I'll requeue the job so that it can rerun on other available node, uh, nodes or other available resources when they become available. And that's probably <coughs> the most pragmatic thing to do because this failure might happen at 2 a.m. The notify, you're not going to find out about it till 8 or 9 in the morning. You really probably want to, if nodes free up between 2 a.m. and 8 a.m., you want to be able to have that job run. So that's kind of our recommendation here, although in your situation there might be reasons to do others. And again, I encourage you to look this up in the documentation because there's some good background information there. Okay, so if a node's dead, okay, steer workload away from it, great, move on. Now let's talk about sick nodes. So this is where it gets a little trickier. Uh, it's not dead yet. Remember the Monty Python, uh, the guy says, you know, I'm not dead yet. Uh, <laughs> still alive, you know, don't take my workload away. Uh, <laughs> what should you do? So what we want to do here is detect signs of sickness before the node goes down so that we can steer jobs away from that node before the job ever starts. So really you want to avoid starting a job on a sick node because it's probably going to die. Maybe it's not dead yet, but it's probably going to die. And you don't want it to fail in the middle of the job because that means they're probably going to have to restart the whole job. And as you know, some of your jobs might run for days. So you want to have a job, you want to make sure that you're not allocating workload on sick nodes. So we want to steer workload away. And Tim and I will show you some ways that you can do that. Uh, then another interesting thing that we've learned from a couple customers recently, uh, when you have sick and dead nodes, the uh, engineer in all of this probably wants to just go say, hey, I'm going to go fix that node. When you have a large cluster, and Google does this, uh, they don't necessarily go and fix every node. They just mark it as bad. They don't steer any, they don't put any workload on that node. And then when they get enough nodes in a rack, they'll replace the whole rack. And in some of your clusters, which can be very large, that might make sense in your environment. So again, think about what you want to do when you have a sick or dead node. But certainly you don't want to start new workload on a node that is sick. So what, what are some signs of sickness? First of all, <coughs> ways that you can measure this, and there are different ways to uh, deal with this, but the mechanism in MOAB that you want to be familiar with are G events, which stands for generic events, and G metrics, generic metrics, which are the occurrence of an event is a G metric, and that could be whatever sign you want of sickness, or a metric that you can be measuring regularly, and if it crosses some threshold, then you say, okay, he's sick. And I'll give you a couple of examples of those. But these are two good areas. Again, search the documentation for G-metric and G-event. There's a lot of good background information there about how you can use these to feed information into the brain that's MOAB and then take action on it. Uh, and then now we're going to talk about some specific signs of sickness and how you can detect them. So disk errors. You can use G-events and G-metrics, and Tim's actually going to give us a demonstration of this to detect the full file system. You can have a simple script that just asks the file system, what percentage utilized are you? And then report that back as a, as a G metric. And then you can have a threshold that fires when that file system crosses some level of fullness. So that you can then either clean up the file system, certainly you want to steer workload away in the meantime, but you can deal with that before the node fails. You don't want to be three days into a six day run and decide, oh gosh, the file system's full. If you can know that earlier, you're going to be a lot better off. Next up is something that I hope you know about, which is SMART errors. Does anyone know what SMART stands for in the context of disks? Five bucks if anybody knows. Okay, it stands for self-monitoring, analysis, and reporting technology. So disks are actually SMART, pardon the pun, and they have little CPUs in them, and they're monitoring when there are read errors, they're correcting for them when they can, but when there are enough read errors, then that's a bad sign. So if you go back to Google's research on disk failure, uh, disks often know when they're going to fail. And they start, uh, you know, but I remember back in the old days, we used to listen to them, you know, when you just had one of them. <laughs> you can't listen to your whole cluster. Smart is sort of the modern way to listen to your disks. And there's a utility you can install in Linux that will let you access those smart parameters. And you can write a script, use, again, using G metrics or G events 
to ask the disk what its smart status is. And it will report number of read errors, number of write errors, all those sorts of things. And when those cross certain thresholds, you can say, ah, problem. I want to steer workload away. So something good to know about. Uh, and you can use G-metrics to monitor. <coughs> Other sorts of errors, uh, cable failures, you know, networks fail for lots of different reasons, misconfigured network, switch failure. Most of the time when you have this kind of failure, you're not going to be able to reach the node, right? So you're not going to be able to know exactly what's going on, you just know you can't reach it, so it's always a chicken and egg, whether it's the network or whether it's the node, but it's something that you can look into. So one thing, and actually Tim will show us an example of this, Torque, if it's still running, can try and restart the network interface if it goes down. So that's a way that you can deal with that. And of course, Moab, if it's not reaching that node, is going to steer workload away and, and move to other nodes. Uh, other hardware, so several of you mentioned DRAM errors. Uh, DRAM, the DRAM you should be using, I hope you're using, <laughs> uh, contains ECC. So you can tell either, you know, when you buy it, you buy ECC or registered. Uh, the two aren't necessarily the same thing, but they often go together. Uh, they'll have nine chips instead of eight on the DIMM. That's a, a, a clue. Uh, but single bit errors are corrected with ECC. Double bit errors are not. But actually, the Linux kernel knows when those single bit errors are happening. And you can actually predict failure of a node or predict failure of RAM by looking at the number of ECC errors. And there's, a again, a Linux utility that you can install. I think it's called EDAC, uh, Error Detection and Correction. And I think the, the module is like EDAC-UTIL, something like that, but look into it. And again, you can use G-metrics to monitor it, and when you start seeing a bunch of read errors, or I'm sorry, a bunch of uh, ECC corrections, then you can start to say, oh, something's wrong with that node. I'm going to mark it as sick, and I'm going to steer workload away from it. So again, you can deal, hopefully you can migrate jobs away, not start them there, and then not have to deal with failure. So, uh, managing jobs during failure. Hopefully you can detect some of these sickness signs. And by the way, I just mentioned a couple, which are some of the common ones, RAM, disks, network, but you might have other causes. Someone mentioned power, right? So maybe in, maybe you're in your environment, you wanna have some sort of way to monitor power. Now, if your whole site goes down, the challenging situation. <laughs> but if uh, parts of it are going down, maybe a power supply fails, there are monitoring utilities, IPMI, and other sorts of mechanisms you can use. So think about what are the causes of failure in my environment, what utilities can I use to monitor those, and then plug those into MOAP. Use the G-metrics, use the G-events to grab those thresholds and look out so you can avoid these things ahead of time. So how do you actually do this stuff? Uh, first of all, you, the way you steer jobs away from sick nodes is you set the node allocation policy. So up here at the top of the slide is sort of the form of the command. Uh, you have node allocation policy, and of course this goes in your MOAP CFG. Uh, you have the priority, and then you have the node config and a priority function. So on that second line, priority F is a priority function. So MOAP, when it's doing scheduling, it's going to look at nodes, and if you don't provide any priority functions, it's going to say, okay, all nodes are the same. But you can use this function to determine, or to help MOAP determine, where it should be allocating its, its workload. And the, the nodes that score higher on this priority function are going to get more work. The nodes that score lower are going to get less work. So a couple examples of configs. Uh, let's pretend that you wanted to run nodes, uh, the fastest nodes with the most available memory that are running the fewest jobs. So you can make a function. You've got a little mathematical equation here. We take speed times 0.01 plus the amount of memory minus 10 times the job count. So that's just a way to heuristically determine, okay, I want to take into account these different factors. Now you can also take into factors things like G-metrics that we talked about. So here's an example with you want to run on the ones with the lowest temperature. There's, there's an example there. And now that G-metric could be your, I want to run on nodes that have the lowest number of DRAM errors, so the lowest, lowest number of smart errors, that sort of thing. So this is the way you plug it in. You set these priority functions. And then the input to that priority function sort of informs Moab which nodes are less desirable, which nodes are more desirable. And Tim will show us a couple other things that you can do to do that. Uh, lastly, notifications. You still want to know. So the beauty of Moab is hopefully you automate all this so when it happens at 3 a.m., you don't have to wake up. It, Moab handles the situation as best it can. But you still need to know because you need to know, gosh, there was a machine down. Uh, eventually, maybe I want to go replace that machine or deal with it in some way. Uh, triggers, which are another mechanism that Tim's going to talk to us a little bit about here, which uh, actually power the, 
the uh, actions that Moab takes can send emails. They can send emails directly. And if you want to include a lot of custom information that the automatic email doesn't include, you can have your trigger call a script that then sends an email. And that script, of course, can make the you know, world's longest email, whatever you want to include in there from information. So notifications are still important and useful in this case. All right, with that, we have Steve Jobs, I mean, Tim Shaw, to uh, <laughs> show us a, a demonstration of how this all works. Tim? Thanks. Chad, you are a tough man to follow. OK, so like Chad said, we're going to show some uh, examples of uh, how we can use Moab to monitor. And uh, primarily, it's going to be through triggers. Um, our first demo is going to be identifying dead nodes and how we can take some action. Now, obviously, if a node is completely dead, there's not much that Moab is going to be able to do. However, in this case, um, a node is, when it's marked down in Moab, doesn't necessarily mean it's dead. It could just be that the PBS mom running on there is not running. And so I came up with these three triggers, and these are um, dependent, dependent triggers in that the first trigger will run, and the second trigger will only run after the first one, and so on with the third. So they run in order. Let me just walk you through here what we got. So um, the mouse here, the mouse is going to help me point. So, we want to decide if this node is actually down or if PBS mom is just not running. And if it's not running, we want to take some action. So when we see this event type here, the E-type is fail, which means that the node is actually reported as down in Moab, then we want to kick off this script, which is what I wrote, and it will pass it in the name of the particular node that's reporting as down. And then we will set this variable that I made up called node state. So in my script, I'm just going to print out um, to standard out that node state equals, and I just made up a term, node down or node up. So that will launch, and that's the only thing that script's going to do. It's just going to diagnose, can I ping you or can I not ping you? Are, you? are you responding to my pings or are you not? So the next trigger is going to respond to that. And so this is going to be dependent upon the first one. You can see here the E-type is still failed, but it requires that this node state variable be set. So it will not fire until that node state is set on the, on the down node. And so we pass that information to my node recovery script, the same node name and the, the output of whatever node state has. And then it will then set this detected failure. Now you'll see there's an exclamation point in front of it, and that's important. So, my notification, in this particular example, I don't want to receive an email about it if Moab was able to fix it. I don't care in this particular case. You may care in yours, in which case you would not want that, but just for this example and intents and purposes, if Moab's able to take care of it, don't let me know about it. So, but if it's not able to fix the problem, this script will return a non-success uh, return code, and so that exclamation point means set this variable if, you ret if the script returns a failure. That's what it means. And so, lastly, my notification trigger will send me this email, and here's my little message, node such and such has failed on this time, and it needs manual intervention because Moab was not able to resuscitate it, and it will then uh, basically unset the variables. But it, it requires the detected failure to be set. So you can kind of see how those three triggers work in ten. Okay. So let's, uh, let's try it out. And uh, hopefully my connections are still up and running here. OK, so on the left side, I got that's my PBS server with Moab running. And on the right is my client. I'm just going to start up Moab. I've got a couple of little things here ready to go. Let's wait for the node to report in here. Just started it up. Thing here, but oh, gotta start with my mom. Okay, he's gonna report in here. You can see here, um, these are my three triggers listed here in this check note. So you can see that they're in a block state, and that just means that the trigger cannot fire right now because it's blocked, because the events that trigger that trigger, that make that trigger fire, just haven't happened yet. So block just means waiting, it's just waiting to fire. Okay, so I'm going to simulate PBS mom going down. And what we're going to watch for here is just watch the state. And you'll see that these three, um, I'm pointing at the screen, no one can see me do that. 
um, <laughs> these three uh, states here uh, from block are going to change in order that way. So here we go. This is going to happen kind of fast, so I got to make sure I start watching. So we're watching for the process. Okay, we see that it's reported down and it's already restarted PBS mom. So that, like I said, did happen a little fast. But you'll notice that the bottom one never fired. The, the email never got to me, and that's what I wanted. I don't want an email if, if Moab is able to restart PBS mom for me. Just take care of it, and I don't want to know about it. So now let's actually simulate a down node. And this is where it gets interesting. Um, here on my VM, I'm just going to pause the VM, which will simulate an unresponsive node. Okay, so here we go. Node is no longer happening. And uh, for some reason, I noticed that in this demo, it can take a, like up to 60 seconds for this to, uh, for Moab to realize that the node is no longer reachable. So in the meantime, I'm gonna see if I can show a slide while we wait for that to happen. Oh, okay, we'll come back to the slide. So you can see it's going down. Um, if you look in the middle, you'll see that first one is trying to ping the node. It's pinging, pinging, pinging. Are you alive? Okay, now it's passed the next one on. So the next one is running and we're trying to... So basically if it's down, and you can see right here, node state, if the second trigger doesn't do anything, if it's down, it just passes the information on. And so, my email is working and my phone has reception. This is where the demo gets really good. If I hear it come through. That wasn't an email, just so you know. I may not be able to get a good... I was hoping to have my little phone ding when I got the email, but we're just going to have to pretend that it happened. Oh, there it goes. Oh, there you go. There you are. Yay. Excellent. Woo. So I got my email from Moab, and it basically says, node Tim02, that's the name of my node, has failed on this date, and it needs manual intervention, because Moab was not able to resuscitate. Okay, so that is the first demo. Now, um, that is basically, like I said, we're dealing with, dealing with just dead nodes. What can we do? Um, uh, let's say LDAP. You have an issue with LDAP, and it like, crashes. And now you have 1,000 nodes. Are you going to get 1,000 emails now? Um, you, just, you, can't, you just can't get a hold of the nodes? Can't if you did, you... you I don't know. That's a good question. You might because I did. It's a node config default, which means it applies to yeah. all nodes. Yeah. So you might have to play with it. And in that case, that's why we hate not okay. not In that case, you might consider just scripting the email being sent, and okay. that's you know just using Perl or something. You could use a throttle in your script or whatever. So, and we're do that. is Josh in the room? Josh in the room. All right. But anyway, so someone smarter than us might know Moab does throttling, but in the event that it doesn't. You can implement that in your external script. You could set you could set a variable and say, hey, you know, if this thing is set, then don't yeah. set anywhere either. Yeah, and All you don't necessarily want to get spammed about every node, <coughs> right? Yeah. But um, in that case, good, maybe good even an email filter would be uh, handy, yeah. right? Um, here, I just have some quick uh, other types of events that we can trigger on, and the action types they have. But I want to get to the next demo. So this next one is also really important because we're going to be talking about thresholds. Thresholds one of the biggest things in monitoring, right? You have some value and you want to know when it gets too high or too low. So how do we do that? Well, first we've got to understand how do we get those generic values into Moab? How does it keep track of it? It's something that, you know, it's generic. It's something that's kind of custom to you. And the way that we do that is through the native resource manager that's built into Moab. So alongside whatever you have, Torque, um, you'll also make this other RMCFG and of course it's type native here. And uh, for monitoring the cluster, we use the cluster query URL attribute and we point it at a script. So this is my script. Now, what does this script do? In my case, it, well, in any case, it needs to return the node name and a geometric tag and a name that you make up. So I made up this perk used and that value that it has. So, Whenever Moab sees that, even though it's never seen it before, it'll say, oh, that's a new one, and I'll put it in. So now Moab will know about this perk use, and it will give it that value. And the same goes for a G event. I have smart status and failure. So, you, and this will be, this script will basically output a line for every node in their G events and G metrics. So that's how the G metrics work, and that's how we get them into Moab 
is using the native resource manager and then this, this script that you'll write. So, now what do we want to do? We've got these thresholds, what do we want to do with them? Well, this particular demo we're going to try and recognize when the disk is getting too full. And I've actually got three different ways to do that. The first one is the, the one that we'll demo, and I'll demo, I'll talk about the other two. But the, we're going to use another trigger, and we're going to have an event type of a threshold, and that threshold is specified right here. Can you guys see my mouse okay? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, what, and this is how you specify it. It's my generic metric that I pulled in when it's greater than 70%, or in this case, it's just that's just a value, right? It's not a percentage, it's a value, but I know it, that it's a percentage. So. Uh, it's 70, then I want to uh, kick off this trigger. So I wrote this script here, it'll fire off this script, and in this particular case, we're gonna pretend that sometimes this, there's a process that launches, and it runs a little bit out of control, and it starts logging everything to a log file, and it starts filling up the disk like crazy. So this is my trigger that's gonna watch for that. So let's, uh, let's do it. My little thing to set up my next demo. I'm gonna watch my note here. Okay, so let's wait for that guy to check in. And I have, I found, oh, I have to unpause my VM too. I've done that. I forget to do that sometimes. Okay, bring him back to life. I think with Putty, I have to redo my session, restart the session as well. Bear with me for a second. I found this terrific uh, command on the internet to flood the disk for testing purposes. <laughs> so I'm going to utilize it. Now, um, in my check note now, I've got another line. This is my new line that's coming in from the native resource manager. There's my disk perk used. Um, and if you had any G metrics, they'd be right below that. So this is how you can see if your G metrics actually being pulled in. Just run the check note on it and it'll show it right there. You can also see I've got my uh, trigger there waiting to fire. Okay, now we're gonna run the crazy command. Oh. Okay, here we go. So just watch that disk perk used. When it exceeds 70%, then that uh, trigger should fire. And it's already 59. It's gonna be full right away here. In fact, I had to lower the threshold because this command filled it up so quickly, but We've lowered it to 70%. Ah. Okay, there it goes. And let's see, we should see, yeah. So I, the, the script, I made it so that it would kill the process for the you know, effect of show. We see that it was terminated. And then back here, we are back down to the 39 or 37% usage. So that is a trigger firing on uh, a G metric. Now I said there was two other ways to do that. I'll just talk about those really quick. The other, the other way to do this is with a G event config, which means we're going to create an event. We're going to actually create a generic event off of this metric, uh, this um, uh, G metric breaking the, the limit that we gave it. So um, we're going to create a G, uh, a G event when this G metric passes the 70%. So we'll record that in the G events file, and then we'll notify the notify means send me an email. So we'll get an email from that. And then we'll same thing with the executing, that's the same script. And uh, that's the name of the G event that will be created. So another way to do it, the advantage to using the trigger is that it shows up in a check job or a check note. You can see the, the different state as it switches. Um, the advantage of this one, it will record it in the G event if you want that. The last way to do it is a peri uh, periodic standing trigger, which is basically a timed event. So in this case, doing the exact same thing, but we're checking it five minutes after every hour. This is a good case for if you don't need to know exactly when it happens, but you know you just want to check every now and again. Uh, maybe it's a little less intensive for your cluster, but you know just check it once an hour and then fire off the script if, if the threshold's been exceeded. Okay, so that is the second demo, and the last demo that we have is actually with regards to Torx node health check script. Maybe some of you have used it before. This is running on the MOM itself. So Moab, these previous demos that we had, this is, they were running from, you know, Moab was basically executing these. This is now, ex this one is executed by, uh, by Torx itself. And it's a script that we'll put into, well, we configure it 
in the bar spool torque config file. Uh, there should be a line break right here, but the, the line that it should be is dollar no check script and the name of your script. And then if you want an interval, uh, if you don't put an interval, I think it'll just do it every torque interval, interval which I believe is every 45 seconds. Um, but you can also do it off of an event, a torque event. Like one torque event I think is job stop or job start. And so you can do a periodic, event driven, or both. So it'll kick those off. So what should, the, what should the script do? Well, if you find an error, then you output the word error, and then you can give it a message. So going back to the smart technology that Chad was talking about, we're going to say error, smart error detected. And then I, this is from you know my script that I'm giving it. Um, actually, this whole thing is from my script. But um, And then when that error is detected, Torque will, will, when it sees the, the, the word error, Torque will mark the node as being down, and then that will get populated back up into MOAP. So we'll see that go down. So um, let's get that one going here. So our third. Okay, and I have a, these are VMs obviously, so I'm going to simulate a smart error. Okay, so right now we're reporting okay. Has anybody ever used or seen smart output? It's basically just a whole bunch of statistics and it's okay, 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 or failure or something like that. So in general, we're just gonna say that overall the disk is okay. So now we are going to say we have a failure. Now this will execute on a timed event. That's what the, the node help script does. So we could be waiting here and where I have to uh, think about a funny joke or something, right? But um, 45 seconds is, is what we'll wait for. But we'll see. Watch for this state here, and then we should see something. There it goes. All right. So torque has now marked it as down, and we know why because of the smart error. And you can see it. My failure. I've Got to put something a little more descriptive. But um, there it is. So now let's say that we fixed the disk. Maybe we we didn't fix it, but we replaced it with a good disk, maybe it was a mirror of the old one, and we swapped it in there, and now the smart status says, hey, this disk is okay. So let's, uh, let's see what happens there. I need another joke. And now another joke is required, thank you. you Jared, why should make you tell a joke? Did you, you need quotes around the okay, out of curiosity? You What's that? Quotes around the okay. You had quotes around. The okay. Oh yeah, um, I need quotes. Not I usually put like failure, and then maybe something else. So I kind of got in the habit of putting quotes around. Oh. But now we can see that we've got it back up. It's idle again, ready for jobs. Um, this mess. This is a message, like a log message. So that will stick around, but it's no big deal. This is letting you know that an error did occur. But there we have it. So those are my three demos. Um, did you want to take it back over? Sure. So Thank I'm going to pass it back over to Chad. All right. Thank you to Tim, I mean Steve Jobs, for uh, that great demo. So <laughs> hopefully you've been able to at least get a taste of the things that Moab can do for you in terms of acting more like a brain and integrating information from your systems. There are a lot of things that Moab will do itself, detecting failure, scheduling around that. Those are sort of obvious and easy that you should be using. Remember that uh, node alloc res failure policy that you should all use. Uh, and then we talked about the ideas of, okay, well, you can take other information, take disk failure, you take RAM errors, you can take temperature, you could take chiller status, you could take whatever you want into effect using these mechanisms of G events and G metrics, and then triggers that go along with that. So uh, I'm, I actually also want to just kind of contradict a little bit something I said this morning. I was complaining a little bit about the documentation because I think we also know that you know we have a <coughs> progress to be made in our documentation. But uh, I'm relatively new to adaptive. I've been here less than a year, and Tim's actually relatively new to adaptive. And we learned everything that we have presented here from the documentation, so it can be done. And <laughs> we encourage you, if you're interested in these topics, to go to the documentation. It actually has pretty good background and explains what these things are. Play with it a little bit. If you have trouble, of course, contact your support rep, and they can help you further. But uh, Mob's really powerful. It, it can automate the uptime of your environment, and it can help you make sure that you're not wasting time, wasting resources, and hopefully you're gonna find the cure for cancer. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll take a few questions. Uh, we may not know everything, but if there are some easy questions, we'll take them.